First, it's important to uh, have some common understanding of what is an hypersonic weapon. An hypersonic weapon, it's something, in this case, we are talking about threats, because we are on the defense side, which combine an endo-atmospheric trajectory, so a trajectory within the atmosphere, at a velocity higher than Mach 5. Mach 5 or 6,000 kilometers per hour or something like that. Uh, you have heard probably of uh, this limit. It's, uh, it's a point at which the airflow around the vehicle is confined by uh, the shock waves. The shock waves close around the vehicle, confine uh, the boundary layer, and you have much heating in this kind of boundary layer. So above Mach 5, there is no magic limit, but above Mach 5, the phenomenon uh, linked to thermal heating becomes significant. And at this point, we have to take into account uh, thermal heating as a major issue in the design of vehicles, whereas it is less the case at lower speed. This is sometimes called uh, the heat wall, uh, making a reference to uh, uh, the sound, uh, the sound wall or the sound barrier at uh, at Mach 1. So there are various types of uh, fast effectors or fast threats. Uh, we have the ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles, they go out of the atmosphere. They travel we, when we are talking about long ranges. Okay, uh, they travel most of the time out of the atmosphere and they re-enter and go directly on uh, the targeted point. A ballistic trajectory is full, fully predictable, okay? Because it's like uh, throwing a, a stone, uh, okay? So uh, it's only driven, a bit, uh, only driven, I would say, by, uh, uh, by gravity and a bit by aerodynamics at the end. MARV, MARV are maneuvering re-entry vehicle. It's a reference to the ballistic maneuvering threats. So those ones have a trajectory which is mostly ballistic, and in the end, there is a possibility to maneuver inside the atmosphere, generally for a question of terminal guidance for engaging a target that can be uh, a mobile uh, uh, target, or simply uh, to slow down to uh, be capable of using uh, terminal guidance sensors. And we have two emerging categories. I say emerging because we have uh, mostly heard about them uh, over the last uh, 10 years. Uh, yeah. It's a long, long story, but they are emerging now. The hypersonic glide vehicles and hypersonic cruise missiles. Both travel in the atmosphere. Both have the characteristics of uh, being capable of maneuvering during most of their flight continuously. And this is where there is a big change with respect to the others, because being capable of traveling continuously gives them the possibility to turn uh, at any moment and target a place you didn't foresee. This is why you have heard, uh, certainly, that hypersonic targets were unpredictable. Well, in fact, they behave a bit like a, a cruise missile or an aircraft at lower speed, lower altitude. So, why have we seen, in recent years, the development of hypersonic weapons? Mostly because of the defense system that is in place today in the Western forces. And also because of intrinsic characteristics. First, intrinsic characteristics. The combination of velocity and range is very interesting when you are traveling at high speed, high altitude. This is the law of Breguet, uh, an aeronautical engineer who uh, uh, made an analytic uh, law uh, for that. When you're traveling at very high altitude and very high speed, you don't spend too much energy. And so you can travel a long, long time because the drag is very low. Second point, which is very important, and this is not an intrinsic characteristic, it's due to the different systems. Today, the different systems that have been designed, particularly in Western forces, are either endo-atmospheric, low altitude, 
below 30 kilometers, so low altitude is a relative notion, okay? So below 30 kilometers, and you have, for example, the US systems like SM2, PAC3, SM6, as there uh, for uh, MBDA. And you have also very high and low atmospheric, beyond 50 kilometers of altitude, or exo-atmospheric defenses against the ballistic missiles, against some long-range ballistic missiles, like the TAD, the SM-3 in the US Navy, or the Arrow-3 uh, in Israel. And there is a gap, a gap between 30 and 50 kilometers of altitude, which is exactly the gap where the hypersonic cruise missiles and the gliders travel. So they can travel a long time before encountering threats for them, so the defenses. And the only defenses they will really encounter then are the terminal defenses. So there is a, a big question for those who want to defend wide <coughs> areas instead of just defending points. Last point, which is important too, traveling at 30 kilometers or 40 kilometers of altitude even if it's not uh, obvious uh, when you tell it, that's low altitude. That's low altitude when you consider the velocity at which it comes to you. It lets you very few time. And in fact, this altitude over a long distance is at the radar horizon. And when it gets out of the radar horizon, which is at those altitudes around 600, 700 kilometers, the time to go to the end is short. And so your strategy of interception has to be timely designed to succeed. Hypersonic effectors such as uh, uh, the, the Zircon in, uh, in Russia. This is a constant improvement. This is not the end of the story. Uh, they are not ma magic. Uh, they can be intercepted <laughs> on the contrary of uh, what has been uh, uh, said by uh, uh, Chinese and, uh, and Russian uh, leaders, uh, they can be particularly intercepted uh, in, uh, in terminal phase. But they are putting an higher challenge for the defense of wide areas, and this is where uh, we have to, to take uh, uh, the gauntlet. So just to give you an highlight, so why is it so uh, so difficult when we, we, talk, we are talking about maneuver. This is an example that was taken from uh, uh, a very well-known report by the CSIS, so it's uh, not a specific MBA thing, that's literature. Uh, and uh, it highlights the difference between a glider trajectory or potential trajectories of glider and a ballistic one. So, if you want to defend a wide area, you cannot defend a wide territory with uh, only one point of launch of uh, uh, interception missiles with very long range, because you don't know simply where it goes, and you don't know at which point it will turn. So there is no point in trying to defend, to, to, to put a shield over a wide, uh, a wide country. The missile defense architecture must be defined according to a global strategy. So here, we are talking about how to use the strengths and weaknesses uh, of our systems to defend uh, against those, uh, those threats. Identifying the assets to be protected, what do we want really to protect, where what kind of asset? Is it uh, a question of local defense? Is it a, a question? Is it a question of area defense? And taking account also the sustainability of the defense. If for each hypersonic target that is incoming in your area, you have to fire multiple missiles, there is a problem. First, we need distributed sensors with early warning and tracking. We need to get the information, an accurate and reliable information. We have to do that not from, not ex nihilo, but we have to do that by integrating all that 
in the existing and planned engagement chains. So this new capability will build up on the ballistic missile defense capabilities. It's not from uh, nowhere. After we enter into the point that I highlighted just before, the threat path prediction. This is essential to be capable to model the threat and this is only possible if you have a deep knowledge of this threat and of the hypersonic effectors. We have this knowledge uh, in, uh, in NBDA. We have after to be the tactical uh, situation analysis and use algorithms supporting the decision algorithm supporting the decision to infer rapidly all the possible trajectories, the most probable, the one on which we have to defend and the one on which we let it pass. High altitude interception. <coughs> this is key because when you have uh, inferred uh, the probable targets, you are building your plan of interception and it's only possible to intercept at high altitude if you want to cover a wide area, if you want to protect a wide area. And protecting at high altitude means several things. First, to be capable of maneuvering at high altitude because your target is maneuvering at high altitude. And this is the great novelty with respect to the ballistic missiles. And second point, you have to go to the interception point as fast as possible. So this means that the interceptor itself is hypersonic in the end. Why? Because the faster you can go, the later you take your decision of firing. And yeah, of course, this is just obvious, this is not science. If you take a decision later, you have more chance to know where it goes. Last point, in such a strategy, the window of interception will be short. So we have to help the human decider, the human operator, to define the right strategy and to propose uh, the right time for launching the missiles. And as this window is short, we cannot re-engage. Missile is launched, if the interception does not work, the only possibility is to do self-protection after. Self-protection of area or local protection. And this is done by another agile effector. In our case, in MBDA, we have the Aster, which has this capability to be the second layer against hypersonic threats, high-end hypersonic threats. Probably worse to start with a few words on the European Commission. So, um, within the EDF, the, um, the EDF work program 2023, there is a line for a concept phase for an endo-atmospheric interceptor. And this line goes with a direct award to MBDA and its consortium partners. So, after releasing the EDF work program 2023, MBDA and its consortium partners, we have received a so-called invitation to tender. And in May time frame, we answered already to this invitation to tender, and our offer is now being evaluated by the European Commission. The name for this proposal, and also the name for the consortium, is HIDES Square. HIDES stands for the Hypersonic Defense Interceptor Study. MBDA will lead a concept phase and technology maturation program for an area protection counter hypersonic interceptor. Please don't mix Heidi Square up with the name NVDA has given and registered for such a missile, which is Aquila, which you can also see on our. Um, on Heidi Square, a few points, just a few points really on the objective on this three year concept phase. First, and this is for me the most important one, developing design of various interceptor concepts before they are selected together with our home nations, France, Italy, Germany, as well as the Netherlands. So we have clearly, or we will manage to have a clear buy-in from our nations, 
for such a solution. Because we need to make sure to address their requirements, to address their threat analysis, and to be in line with their understanding moving forward. So we are entering the concept phase with, a, with three multi-stage intercept architectures. You can see them on the bottom. On the middle we have a three-stage, on the left we have a three-stage, but we are also doing a two-stage concept. We are developing them through the three years of the concept phase and selecting one at the end together with our nations. The second objective is to mature the technologies that are needed um, to deliver the best interception solution and to fulfill the requirements of our partners and nations. So on some key technologies we are starting by a tier level of, of one or two. In the end we need to manage to come to a certain technology readiness level to put our nations in a position to start development after three years. Last but not least, our objective is to gather the best industrial and scientific experts to team up and to set the basis for long-term cooperation. And on this team, I have the next slide. So here you see some information on the consortium as well as the industrial footprint of Hydes Square. So Hydes Square brings together 90 partners, and in addition to this, roughly 30 plus subcontractors in 14 European countries to addressing this European inclusiveness also of the European Commission. So we are addressing or we are having collected uh, defense groups, universities, SMEs, perhaps institutions, all experts in their domain in the key technologies needed to carry out this action. You see here that, yes, we have our core nations with France, Italy, Germany and the Netherlands, but we are also addressing or including Spain, we are including Sweden, Finland, Romania, Hungary, Austria, so in total 14 European countries together carrying out this action. So to put it in a nutshell, our consortium is gathering national champions of missile defense all over Europe with the highest aeronautical scientific references. We are bringing also on board actors of novel domains to counter this, uh, this new challenge of contact zone. So this is already my last slide to conclude our presentation, which gives you a view of the companies that are in our consortium, <coughs> Heidi Square, that are part of our proposal from a partner perspective. We will all meet today here in Le Plessis, in Le Bourget, not Le Plessis, in Le Bourget. We have a kick-off event to define the next actions that are needed to carry out the action. And uh, you can see that in the various countries of France, Italy, Germany, the Netherlands, and also Spain, we are bringing together Roxel, Ariane Group, Lunret, Thales Lass, as well as Onara. In Germany, MBDA Germany, Bayern Chemie and TLW, as well as the DLR and OHB. In Italy, we have in addition to MBDA Italy, Avio, Aero, as well as Avio. G and Chira. Netherlands, the three companies are supported by their room D, which is GK and Fokker, Thales Netherlands, as well as TNO. And we are bringing also uh, MBDA Spain on board. And this somehow concludes uh, my presentation on the project 